Hello, good morning or good afternoon to others. Welcome to the DICES Smart Colposcopy Global Webinar. I'm Amanda Derman from DICES Medical in the UK and I'm going to be your host this morning. So let's hope that I can get all the buttons pressed in the right order. I'm joined today by Mr Julian Brady, consultant gynaecologist from Luton and Dunstable University Hospital in the UK along with my colleague Dennis van der Molen, who looks after the Middle East, Africa and Asia regions. And finally joining us from Athens, Dr. Manolis Papagianakis, who's our clinical lead and expert on all things evidence-based here at DICES. I'm delighted to let you know that we've got delegates joining us today from Europe, Africa, the Middle East region uh, and Asia. Um, given the current lockdown situation that we're, most of us are facing, we, means we can't travel to you but with the wonders of modern technology, uh, we can all meet today virtually. Before I hand the webinar over to Julian, there are just a couple of instructions that I'd like to share with you. All attendees on the webinar uh, will be muted to ensure that we have good sound quality throughout, but, you, uh, but please do ask any questions that you may have. You can do this by typing your question into the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll put the questions to Mr Brady and the rest of the panel at the end of the presentation and we'll endeavour to get through as many as we can in the time that we have. If we don't answer all of the questions, we will send out a Q&A communication uh, following today's event, uh, as well as a copy of the presentation and a link to the clinical evidence. So it's with great pleasure that I'm going to hand the next 30 minutes um, over to Julian Brady, who's going to share his experience um, of implementing DICES into um, a UK, uh, uh, into um, his UK practice. And um, Julian, I'm just going to hand over to you now. Perfect, Amanda, thank you uh, very much indeed. Let me just make sure I'm all on to. Thank you, very, Amanda. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to um, everybody wherever you are uh, listening or watching this webcast uh, in the world today. Uh, we're still on lockdown here in the UK. Uh, I would suspect that a number of people watching today are also in lockdown. So first of all, I hope that you, your families and your colleagues and everybody is safe at this very um, challenging time. I'm also aware that there's a number of people uh, watching who English might not be their first language. So I will go through the presentation um, as slowly as feasible and also using words uh, as understandable um, as possible. So as Amanda said, it's my privilege to be able to talk to you about how I have incorporated DICES technology um, into my colposcopy practice and how I actually think it's actually been a, a revolution to my whole um, colposcopy um, practice. Standard in any uh, presentation, these are my uh, disclosures. Most of you, I would have hoped, will know what the DICES technology is, but a very, very quick recap for those uh, uh, clinicians today watching who may not. DICES is an adjunctive colposcopy system. So it, it is operating in the background, but you as the clinician or you as the colposcopist are still very much in charge of the whole examination and doing what you would normally do. So you effectively perform the same colposcopy you have always performed previously. And here is the application of acetic acid going on to an example of the cervix um, on the right hand side of the screen, which has been speeded up. Whilst you're doing your normal colposcopy, looking for all the signs and symptoms we've always been taught to look for, acetoite changes, uh, new vessel formation, punctation, in the background, the computer is taking a digital image of the cervix every seven seconds and passing it through a spectrometer, which allows it to give you, at the end of two minutes, what we call the DICES map. And the DICES map is a summative, um, uh, sort of addition of all of the pixels related to acetoite. So it gives you a quantitative measure as to the acetoite changes that you're seeing 
very clearly demonstrated uh, by the color coded map on the right hand side with blue indicating uh, normal or low grade changes and as you go up through the spectrum of colors indicating a higher percentage of dense aceto white which is obviously where the most abnormal areas on the cervix uh, would be. So you have performed your standard normal colposcopy examination, you haven't done anything different, you are just given an additional piece of information at the end of the examination to help you manage um, the, um, the lady in front of you. As I said on my disclosure slide, this is a very um, personal view. So I have uh, been involved with, with uh, using the Dysys technology for a long time now. I uh, started using it in 2014, and after about two clinics, I hadn't used a single other colposcope other than the Dysys um, colposcopy. I have a very, very large government NHS practice and a significant private practice. So I think worldwide now I've done more DICES examinations than any other um, single um, clinician. It is the only colposcope um, that I used. So winding back in time a little bit, why did I, why did I think I needed to uh, use a different type of technology? In 2013 and 14, I was one of the National Quality Assurance Directors for the UK Cervical Screening Programme. And people were very regularly beginning to ask me, did I have any views on adjunctive technology that was available? And uh, rather embarrassingly in 2012, 2013, I realized I didn't really have any views. So I felt it was incumbent upon me to try and understand whether this new technology that was available would actually be um, beneficial to patients, as I realized I was being asked this in a semi-official capacity. First thing I did was look at the evidence, and uh, at that point in time, NICE, which in the UK is our national governing body regarding clinical evidence, suggested that and you know recommended that actually DICES was both clinically and uh, cost effective. So for me, that was one of the greatest bits of reassurance that actually our national governing evidence body had looked at the evidence and had said that you know this technology is actually clinically and cost effective. I then went to see a live demonstration, my colleagues uh, Raj Nayak and Ann Fisher um, up in Gateshead and I spent a very, very useful day with them actually seeing the technology being uh, used um, in action. By this particular point in time, I was already a, I, I, would consider my, I would have considered myself a very experienced colposcopist at that point in time. I'd then been a practicing colposcopist for the greater part of 20 years at that point in time. And I think initially, like most clinicians, I thought that I would only find DICES useful for uh, application to patients with low-grade disease. And um, being honest and being truthful, I was um, a little bit embarrassed to say that within two or three weeks, I'd sort of realised I'd got that wrong in a good way, that actually that this technology was actually going to revolutionise how I looked after all of my patients, including those ladies uh, referred with high-grade disease, being able to manage <clears throat> these ladies conservatively, which we'll go on to talk about later in the presentation, but also some things I'd never really thought about, which is very much the cornerstone of my practice, which is about quality assurance, education and teaching, and also what sort of experience the patient gets. So very, very quickly, I realised that I got this wrong, that it wasn't going to help me a little bit. It was actually going to help me an awful lot and was going to actually completely change my colposcopy practice. These are very busy slides. Um, I just wanted to show you that there is a significant evidence base um, regarding DICES that is now reproduced the world over. That is not particularly surprising. A cervix in the Northern Hemisphere is exactly the same as a cervix in the Southern Hemisphere, and the disease process in terms of HPV is identical um, the world over. But there is now a significant breadth of evidence that suggests um, that DICES is um, is very, very useful in terms of its uh, application to uh, clinical practice. Should any of you wish to look at these evidence based in more detail, then obviously we'd be, I'm sure that the people at Dysis would be delighted to provide you with a PDF link to all of these studies um, quoted. <clears throat> so going into a little bit more detail now, wherever you, wherever you find yourself practicing colposcopy in the world at present, cervical screening is changing. 
and it's changing very much to taking primary HPV screening. For instance, in the United Kingdom where I work, we had a very well established cervical screening program, but it had actually been established before we knew that HPV was the causative um, agent in cervical cancer. So I've recently had the opportunity to go to different parts of the world where they're starting their own screening programs, Malaysia, Thailand, for instance, and quite rightly, these parts of the world are going straight to primary HPV screening and not relying on cytology as the first test. Coupled to this, we're also seeing vaccination coming in. So, uh, you know, for instance, the UK, we have a nationwide vaccination program to uh, school girls at the age of 11, 12 and 13, which means they are vaccinated against HPV 16 and 18. So as these young women grow to be younger women entering the cervical screening program, you're going to see a much lower percentage of high grade lesions because you have removed the CIN 16 and 18, which is responsible for approximately 70% of CIN 3 and uh, invasive cancer. However, the, the, the flip side of this is HPV is a very, very sensitive test. So you do unfortunately see a significant increase in the number of ladies referred to colposcopy, even if you're using a secondary cytology triage. So all these things put together actually means that you've got a much higher percentage of low grade disease and you've actually got high grade disease, which might be potentially much, much harder to find. And it also throws up some very interesting patient groups, which we haven't seen before, which are those ladies who are persistently HPV positive, but have negative cytology. So there are significant changes uh, going on in screening. Very thankfully, I think we've, uh, the, the evidence now has uh, debunked the theory that um, non-16 and non-18 CIN lesions look different. Certainly my experience looking down a colposcope um, is that the lesions are identical, but these lesions are much smaller. So my own personal experience over the past few years as primary HPV screening has come in is that you are seeing significantly higher number of low grade referrals, your high grade referrals are much harder to find. And when you do find a high grade referral, they tend to be very, very small lesions. This is in, in stark contrast to when I first started 20, 25 years ago, when you would get very, very obvious, very large uh, lesions um, on the cervix. You do of course still see those, but they are um, increasingly uh, uncommon. So colposcopy then has two challenges. It has these new challenges of capacity. We're going to need to safely discharge our patients and also that the disease is actually much harder to find. But once you start using the new technology, you actually realize that actually the old technology was, um, and I'll put this politely as I can do, a little bit uh, old fashioned and also has some significant challenges associated with it. And that's basically the unreproducible nature of the exam, meaning that, that a colposcopy done by one individual may be very, very different to a colposcopy done by another clinician because we don't all do it the same way. We don't use the same amount of acetic acid. We don't look at the cervix for the same amount of time. Other pe um, some people put different importance on different types of parameters. Some people are very swayed by uh, by aceto white changes, other people are very swayed by punctation or new vessel uh, formation. And with a binocular microscope, unless you're very lucky to have digital video 4K recording capacity, you've got no way of actually archiving or image capturing or looking at the colposcopy examination that you're doing. And remember, colposcopy examin a colposcopy examination is a dynamic examination. It occurs over a two minute period of time and that, that examination changes throughout that two minutes. And it's very, very important how it changes in that two minutes because it's your opinion is based over the whole two minutes worth of examination, not the final end point. It's a little bit like me saying to somebody, I would like to, I'd like to see the men's 100 meter finals at the Olympics and somebody takes me a picture at the start of all the athletes lined up and somebody takes me a picture at the end when the athletes are crossing the line. It tells me nothing about the race or what's happened in the race. It just gives me two end, a start and an end point. So I think that's one of the, the principal difficulties of old fashioned binocular colposcopy is that it is particularly outdated 
with a significant number of intra-observer um, errors potentially. So how does DICIS do this? Well, actually, DICIS actually sorts out almost all of that for you. Um, it makes the exam reproducible. And how it makes the exam reproducible is that everybody is looking at the same thing. So it doesn't matter whether I do a colposcopy in the UK, or I have a colleague who does it in Durban, or I have a colleague who does it in Kuala Lumpur, or a colleague who does it in Sydney, the examination for the first time becomes a reproducible examination. You need to get a, a, a central view of the cervix. You, the same amount of acetic acid is squirted onto every single examination equidistant over the cervix. The map will not generate until I've had at least two minutes worth of data. So I'm forced to look at the cervix for the right amount of time to see the whole process of colposcopy happening. And we're looking at identical parameters in the background. The computer is purely looking at pixels, so it is giving you a quantitative rather than a qualitative measure as to what is um, happening. And most importantly, you have a dynamic onboard document, uh, documentation system, which is so you have the whole colposcopy examination recorded. You can replay every single colposcopy examination that you've ever performed on any patient. You can take multiple uh, static uh, pictures at each point or can replay the whole um, examination. And all these things together, for me, gives me increased confidence that I'm actually managing my lady who's in front of me with her abnormality in the best possible way at the first visit to colposcopy, be that with treatment, with biopsy or uh, without biopsy. So here's some visualizations of it. So you have a standardized, it's all about standardization so that uh, examinations are reproducible. You can see the biopsy areas are highlighted. This allows you to target your biopsies. And the, imp the improved study, which is the biggest study that's ever been done in colposcopy, effectively shows that you have a 30% higher chance of identifying high-grade CIN compared to traditional colposcopy by using DICES. And this is all due to your biopsy efficiency and targeting the areas of biopsy. Rather than taking blind biopsies, you have specific targeted areas where the densest areas of aceto white um, are. This allows your MDT to be a completely different um, entity to previously. For the first time ever on difficult cases, you can, um, you can actually review the case from a colposcopy point of view. It's always been very easy to look at somebody's cytology and look at somebody's histology for a second time. You merely get the slides um, out of storage and have a look at them again. But now for the first time ever, you can actually see somebody's whole colposcopy examination and you have the additional quantitative uh, data of the DICES map um, on top of it. And this gives you the confidence to discharge patients either when you've treated them appropriately or actually if they've got low grade disease or effectively no disease, you have the confidence to discharge them to, uh, to routine screening or out of your colposcopy um, clinic. Some examples I've talked for a little bit now, so it'd be nice to actually see some cervixes. So these are real examples from my own um, practice. Obviously, we've had any patient identifiable data uh, removed. This is a lady referred with low grade um, disease and her colposcopy speeded up, as you can see, is very normal. And her DICES map concurs that she has got minimal aceto whitening. Um, and I was therefore very, very happy given this lady's age to, to uh, discharge her to routine screening, which in the UK at her age is a three year follow up. Slightly different referral. This is again a lady with uh, low grade disease and as you can, sorry, a low grade referral. And as you can see, I'll replay the examination again. Some significant aceto white changes, but very, very importantly, those aceto white changes have actually faded very, very quickly throughout the examination. I can't see any um, indicators of high grade disease such as abnormal vessels or punctation. So my colposcopic opinion even before the map is that this lady has actually got low grade changes, potentially CIN1. And again, the quantitative measures would suggest that that is also the case. 
I have a very low biopsy threshold, as we'll begin, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I chose to not biopsy this lady, which is in agreement with our national uh, screening program, and discharged her to 12 monthly uh, follow-up for repeat uh, cytology um, sample. Another low-grade referral. As you can see on this one, there is a very obvious area, very dense acetobiote staining uh, with punctation. So this, uh, I think you'd agree, is a very obvious area of high-grade disease. And this, again, is concurred by the map, which shows a very dense changes with the uh, red and green uh, suggesting high-grade um, CIN. One of the questions we're always asked is, does uh, diop, is, is does bi sorry, is does diocese change your biopsy rate or does it cause you to over treat people and that's actually although they're two very very simple questions it's actually quite a complicated answer because it really depends upon what your local practice is and how you choose to do colposcopy in terms of biopsy and treatment or see and treat the the knee-jerk reaction, I think, from people who haven't seen the technology is that the computer will almost be forcing you to biopsy uh, a lot more people and then end up potentially over-treating a whole load of people. Actually, the answer is actually the reverse of that. What tends to happen is it actually means that your biopsies just become more targeted. And here's my own uh, local data of when I first uh, introduced um, diocess within our practice. So JAB is myself, uh, GF is a very nice young lady called Jen Ferguson, who is our nurse colposcopist. And you can see that in the pre diocese year, in terms of low grade referrals, we had 289 referrals and a biopsy rate of 8%. We were quite um, very, very uh, anxious, as well, but, but, but we were very, very certain that we should be following the national guidance. I'd actually help write the national guidance at that point in time, which was that low-grade disease, you shouldn't be performing biopsies when you were happy it was low-grade disease unless you thought there was any potential high-grade disease there. So effectively, in a low-grade referral, you should only be biopsying if you were concerned there was high-grade CIN or this was a chronic lesion of more than two to three years. So our subsequent biopsy rate is quite low. You can see there only 8% of biopsies that we took were only picking up CIN in 22% of those. However, 12 months later in diocese, so 337 referrals, we've done 21 biopsies, so our biopsy rate stays about the same at 6%. We've actually increased our hit rate to almost 70%, so 0.67, so we've gone from 20% to almost 70% in terms of making our biopsies uh, more targeted. And that's actually what's emerging the real world over. Everybody who, my colleagues who use it in the UK as well, report exactly the same things, that actually it doesn't change their biopsy practice. It just makes their biopsies um, better. They're just, they're just more targeted and their hit rate of CIN is much higher. As you would expect, going right back to the beginning with the evidence, it effectively nice saying that, cop that colposcopy diocese is more effective. This is a real world example from my own clinic as to how effective that is. I have very much uh, made some of my sort of reputation on conservative management of, of high grade CIN. It's emerged even in, in the 25 years that I've been doing colposcopy, there has been a significant change in how we manage uh, some ladies with high grade disease, especially those ladies who have fertility aspirations or haven't completed their family. The meta-analysis in the BMJ, which I'm sure most of you are, are aware of, is very clear that up to 60 to 80% of CIN2 will regress. So, Effectively, you know, many years ago, we perhaps overtreated a huge number of ladies uh, with uh, CIN2. At the time, we were under the misapprehension that a LETS procedure was uh, safe as opposed to a cone biopsy in terms of premature delivery rate. But certainly, the work by Alexandra Castanon over the past few years has shown quite categorically that it's all related to the volume of cervix that is removed irrespective of the modality of how you remove that part of the service which would make which would make biological complete sense in terms of 
in, in terms of the overall volume that you um, remove. So this is a lady who has referred again to me with um, severe dyscariosis, and you can see from her colposcopy, she does indeed have some dense aceto white um, changes. There's some punctation you can also see there. And my colposcopic opinion was that this was CIM2. I took some targeted biopsies uh, with the map, and these did, in, it did indeed confirm CIM2. This lady was about to start some um, IVF treatment. She hadn't had any children, and she was desirous that her cervical integrity would remain as intact as possible. So she agreed to conservative management and agreed to be have a repeat colposcopy and cytology examination six months later. Six months later, she attends. And you can see there's a very, very significant difference in her colposcopy, which is highlighted by the DICIS map also. There was a significant improvement uh, in the appearance of her cervix. She then subsequently, six months after that, went on to have a negative cytology sample, a negative HPV test, and a completely normal colposcopy, and as such was discharged to routine screening, and she uh, went ahead with her IVF treatment. So DICIS allows you to do something really, really um, powerful in terms of conservative management, which is what we call smart track, which is uh, longitudinal tracking. And it actually allows you to look at real time colposcopy examinations from six different dates in real time next to each other. So you can compare colposcopies from previously. This is hugely important because most colposcopy units, certainly from a government standpoint, you are very, very unlikely to see the same colposcopist at every single visit uh, when, you, um, when you attend. So the first thing I can do is look back at my colleague's examination six months previously or 12 months previously, and you're able to, for the first time ever, properly longitudinally track the patients that you are um, offering conservative management to. People talk um, about treatment, and although I'm very, very supportive of conservative management for some types of CIN2, I think you need to take this um, from a very pragmatic point of view, and this is all about actually treating patients at the right point in time. If you have a diagnosis of CIN2 and you're 50 years old and you have no fertility aspirations, absolutely see and treat is entirely the right management for these patients. But if you're 25 years old and it's your first sample has suggested a very small volume of CIN2 disease and you're yet to have any children, uh, it, to me it is incomprehensible that you would offer these ladies treatment at this point in time when up to 60% of those ladies will regress over a period of time if correctly chosen. So for me, DICIS is all about, in terms of see and treat, it's actually making sure that you're treating any individual at the right point in their cervical screening journey. Because remember, once you treat somebody, in terms of how you follow them up, potentially becomes more difficult in terms of scarring to the cervix, obstetric complications. So actually, you need to be really, really mindful that actually when you treat somebody, you're treating them at the right point in time in their cervical screening um, journey. I find DICE's particularly useful, though, for those ladies who are coming towards the end of the screening programme with ongoing low-grade changes who may have had multiple episodes of uh, treatment. You don't necessarily want to hysterectomise these ladies because you may not get rid of the disease, and it allows you, a little bit like the, using the smart track facility, to monitor these ladies um, over a period of time without having to do anything as invasive as um, a hysterectomy operation. We've touched on this already previously, but you know the quality assurance of the DICIS system is unparalleled. Every single exam is reproduced. You can play it back um, in detail. This is protective of both you and your patients, and I'm very, very happy to name and shame uh, myself. You can see this is an old, <laughs> old-fashioned paper uh, recording. I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with that. And this is effective. This is the same entry. Um, on the DICIS system, and you can see 
I mean, my, my, my diagrams very beautiful. I think you'd agree, but it's uh, nothing like the um, the quality of the reproducible exam that you have archived um, forevermore. In terms of practicalities, how long does it take? You know, people say, "Oh my God, how, how am I going to learn this?" It's incredibly easy. I would think that anybody would be cut any any clinician, any colposcopist would be entirely familiar with the machine after just two clinics. The reason for that is it's not asking you to do anything different. You are doing exactly what you would have done always. Admittedly, you're using a slightly different machine, but your process of doing a colposcopy is entirely the same. Taking a history from the patient, looking at the cervix, putting on the acetic acid, looking for changes, and then making an opinion. And then the and then the map is given to you at the end to, to help you make that opinion. You then go on to choose how to manage your patient. There is not an automated robot which forces you to take biopsies. You are doing exactly the same thing. So it's a very, very, very quick learning curve to uh, use the technology. It integrates with electronic uh, patient records and patient administration systems. I think that it's got some clever dike on something or other, which is a little bit out of my uh, remit, but it is able to talk to all of the um, major electronic patient record systems. There is no increase in time for patients in clinic because, as we said right at, you know, at the start of the slide, it is exactly the same procedure. You're not doing anything different as to what you would have done previously. You can biopsy people without changing the speculum, without changing any of the setup um, of the machine. The headpiece on the diocese ultra is designed in such a way that there is no impediment to you both biopsying and treating. You simply click on a small suction tube if you choose to uh, treat somebody at that point in time. I'm aware that a lot of my colleagues will also do vulvoscopy. Vulvoscopy is a large part of my workload and Dysis is absolutely perfect for vulvoscopy as well. Remember, vulvoscopy tends to be in patients over a chronic period of time and all of the advantages of the systems in terms of um, image comparison, tracking and being able to record the examinations and archive it is absolutely perfect for management of um, vulvar um, sorry, for management of VIM, lichen sclerosis, because you can actually see changes over time um, that are recorded. Training and education remains a cornerstone of any part of medicine and um, I've been really impressed by the way that DICES has recently launched something called Colposcopy Skills. I was able to um, help as one of their um, expert reviewers with this. And this is a fantastic learning tool which effectively uses the, many of the hundreds of thousands of examinations that we've got now to allow people to do some effectively live colposcopy simulations. So it's a, I suppose it's almost like the sort of, um, you know, you can actually pretend that you're doing it. You are given the patient information. You then watch the colposcopy. You're then able to select your biopsy points. But then the most important bit is that's actually then cross-correlated against where those individuals took to choose biopsies against the actual histology that was taken. And there's an expert reviewing consensus um, on each case. Brilliant for colposcopists in training, uh, even for us, we're very lucky in the UK, we have a very robust training system. A lot of other places uh, in the world don't. It's a fantastic uh, tool for people in training. It's also a pretty fantastic tool for those of us who, who wish to continue to learn. You know, I'd done, you know, best part of 15, 20 years without diocese, but now it's an integral part of my practice. I had to learn how to do that. So even the most experienced practitioner will find the training and education with this very, very useful. And obviously it can contribute to your continuing professional development. And um, I haven't loaded in a video of it, but here's some stills of the various different um, um, panels that you see um, on the colposcopy skills. And obviously, it's a huge uh, case library that we have um, identifiable to us. As we begin to draw towards the end of my um, half an hour with you, mustn't also get, there's a patient on the end of this. And one thing that struck me very, very early was how uh, how well patients understood what you were speaking to them about with the advantage of the diocese map. 
patients find it very, very easy to understand the map. So we show the patients at the I show the patients at the end of the examination once they've dressed themselves up or or in or sort of mid-examination if you're going to biopsy, you show them the map and I use the very um, sort of very uh, sort of uh, weather-based analogy that it's a little bit like a weather map of your service with blue I'm very happy with but actually if it changes towards red orange or white um, I'm concerned that there might be some abnormal areas there and patients seem to understand this very very uh, readily so much so that again the lovely Gemma Ferguson managed to um, head up the largest ever patient satisfaction survey in colposcopy it was a multi-center um, audit where we looked at patient satisfaction with with DICE's technology and also traditional technology and you can see there was a significant reduction uh, in anxiety and a huge increase in understanding of patients. I think we forget how intimidating a colposcopy examination is, it really does cause considerable and very, very real anxiety in the women, not only because of the very intimate nature of the examination, but also in the background that those ladies will have had a letter saying you have an abnormal test which may indicate an abnormality, therefore you require colposcopy. So I think reducing that anxiety is um, crucial. I'm hopeful we have a particular problem in the UK with ladies who once they've been seen in colposcopy for the first time don't tend to come back for follow-up as perhaps as often as they should do. I would hope that this reduction in anxiety over time would help reduce uh, the non-attendance um, at follow-up. There is also something about clinician satisfaction as well and I'm a great believer and, and you'll see on these last few slides that actually it's incumbent upon us to try and actually make things better, not only make things better for our patients, but also we should be making things better for ourselves. Why would you not want to use the very best technology available to you? You could quite happily make a telephone call with an Alexander Bell phone, but why on earth would anybody want to use that when you've got this state-of-the-art technology of a smartphone and all of the additional advantages that that gives you? So that's my analogy with diocese, actually. You can quite happily do a colposcopy with an old-fashioned binocular colposcope. Yes, of course you can, but you can do a fantastically better colposcopy with a smartphone uh, version of colposcopy, which is diocess, with all of the additional functionality that it, um, that it offers to you. And if I take the analogy of the 30%, imagine if you went to, imagine if you were a business and you said, by using this new technology, you'll be able to sell 30% more of your products. You'd use it straight away. If you're a sporting team, imagine if you said, if we use this new technology, we'll be able to win 30% more games. Surely you would use it straight away. I, I, don't, I don't see why there's a resistance to people wanting to have the very best technology available to them. We do this in those of you who do laparoscopic surgery, you wouldn't dream of doing laparoscopic surgery without a 4K monitor now. You just wouldn't do it. So why do you not extrapolate that same to uh, colposcopy? So I believe actually my job is made significantly easier by having state-of-the-art technology um, to do it. And that actually leads me to the very last couple of slides, which is all about improvement and changes. And the the what this slide is trying to show is it's showing two different it's showing multiple different generations of women because actually the women that we are screening at the moment are going through very very significant changes. So those ladies who we screened over the last number of years we have screened very well with a screening program, but the young women who are now entering the screening program will enter it in a very different way. They are very highly likely to have been vaccinated, so they will have removed 16 and 18 disease. They may well in the, in, in the forthcoming years have very different screening uh, applications with the advantages of self-sampling, self-screening. Their journey potentially towards colposcopy will be very different to the people who previously had colposcopy. So I think it's incumbent upon us, those of us who do colposcopy, that when these young women now start to arrive in colposcopy, that we also have the need to improve. If we have technology that means we can track these ladies better, that we can increase our, uh, um, our disease detection rate, I think it's, in, it's incumbent upon us that we should use that and use that to give the maximal possible improvement to the screening services of the ladies of which we're charged to look after. 
cervical disease still remains a huge problem. And just to put that into perspective, when I updated the slides yesterday, looking at the um, data available to me, COVID worldwide deaths at the moment, just over a quarter of a million yet the most up-to-date uh, data from the cervical uh, screening would suggest that from the WHO figures that in 2018, 300,000 women died from cervical cancer. And WHO considers this to be entirely preventable with both vaccination and, and uh, screening. So ladies and gentlemen, very many, very many thanks for your time so far. Um, thank you, and I will hand over back now to Amanda to go through the questions. Thank you very much indeed, Julian, um, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to ask the rest of the panel to rejoin. We've had some excellent questions um, come in, so um, I'll, I'll I'll kick off straight away if that's okay. Um, one question here, I use iodine in my practice. Can I still use iodine? Uh, with dysoscoposcopy? Um, yeah, so um, so I use iodine still as well. Um, iodine is a fantastic demarcation agent, but you 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 must use it after the map has been generated because obviously iodine changes the colours significantly um, on the cervix. So you would do your traditional so so you would do your dysoscoposcopy. You would look for your aceto white changes. You would have your map, and then by all means you can use um, iodine afterwards. I still use, I was taught to use iodine for every treatment that I do simply because it demarcates the area so much better. So yes, you can um, continue to use iodine as a as like a standard part of your diagnostic pathway. Thank you. Um, quite a few questions in about glandular disease. Is there a role in glandular disease or invasion of diaphragm? So glandular disease remains very, very difficult, you know, and the reason that glandular disease is very difficult from a colposcopy point of view is it's not going to be, a lot of the time, the disease is not readily accessible. The acetoyl-white changes on glandular disease when it is visible are the same as with um, CIN disease. So if it's visible in the canal, then you'll be able to see it. But obviously, there will always be that element of glandular disease that is potentially deeper in the canal very similar to a type three transformation zone where you might not be able to see the transformation zone. You know, Dysis is very, very good, but it hasn't got Superman X-ray vision that allows you to go deeper um, into the canal. And, you know, glandular disease remains a very, very uh, challenging aspect, uh, you know, challenging condition in all aspects of colposcopy. Thanks, Julian. Uh, next question. Um, do you find any difference in your colpos colposcopy practice with women who have persistent positive high-risk HPV and negative cytology? And do you find DISIS gives you more reassurance in monitoring patients? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, this is a really, really challenging group of patients. Um, we've begun to see quite a lot of patients who have probably been cytology negative for years, They've had negative smear tests. They've never been anywhere at colposcopy, and then all out, all of a sudden, they're thrust to a colposcopy late in their screening career because they are HPV uh, positive. I think what it allows you to do is that very, very powerful visualization, which enables somebody to see their cervix and to see the DICES map saying, "Here you have a normal cervix. I think it's normal. The computer also thinks it's normal. There's a tiny spattering of blue. You have a very normal examination." you have a normal examination, I'm happy to discharge you to routine screening, you are likely to be in that cohort of women who seems to retain their HPV, but it doesn't appear to have done anything to your cervix at all, which would be supported by all the negative smear tests that you have had throughout your career. I think it's a very, it's a very powerful thing to actually see the map because, you know, HPV gets a sort of, you know, women get obviously very, very concerned that they've got this persistent HPV. And I think it's powerful to actually see a normal cervix, which reassures them that the cervix is normal. Thanks, Julian. Uh, probably a question for um, Manolis. How good is the evidence regarding DISIS and VIN? Is it comparable to the evidence for DISIS and CIN? 
Well, there have not been uh, any studies on um, quantifying the performance of the DICEMAP on uh, VIN, so we would not recommend the, uh, the use of the mapping for uh, diagnostic purposes of VIN. We can, uh, DICEMAP can still be used for vis visualization and for documentation, photographic documentation or video clip documentation of what is observed uh, outside of uh, the cervix, but the uh, the mapping technology has not been uh, validated for VIN, so we would not recommend it used for uh, for that purpose. And I'd like to support that as well. I sort of, you know, I have a very very large um, VIN cohort and lichen sclerosis cohort in my patients, and I don't use the map because it hasn't been validated to use it. But the DICE technology is invaluable in being able to look back at previous examinations compared to still photographs. So to be able to replay the whole volvoscopy examination and see those changes. So yes, um, I would agree with what um, with what Manola says. Theoretically, I suppose it could map, but it hasn't been validated. So I don't ever use the I don't ever use the map to validate a, a volvoscopy examination. Okay, thanks, Julian. Um, another question here. What is your advice when introducing DICES colposcopy where training is not as standardised as in the UK? Uh, I mean, training, training is really difficult. And just because you have a training system doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good training system. Um, you know, that's a very different, uh, that's a very different uh, podcast uh, altogether. I, I think that's the beauty of colposcopy skills, DICE skills. You have the ability to look at, you know, at least 50 cases and actually do practice runs and practice um, sessions on this. And the really, really good thing about when you're introducing it, especially to trainees, is you've got an automatic second opinion on any single colposcopy you've ever done. OK, so if you were concerned as a new colposcopist or as a trainee, you know, you just play it back when your when your trainer comes in later that afternoon, later that next day. You've got the ability to just look back at exactly what you've done and your trainer may say, well, actually, I would have biopsied that or actually I would have treated that. You bring the patient back. Uh, you, you know, you've got a perfect you've got a perfect fallback in people who are at the start of their colposcopy career in terms of every single examination could effectively be a uh, second opinion by their trainer. Okay, thanks, Julian. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, I think this one's definitely from the UK. Have you noticed a reduction in cytology and histology, histology mismatches at MDT, uh, i.e. is the MDT caseload reduced? Yeah, so MDT, I, you know, and from a from a public health England point of view, uh, the um, the MDT is really the single most important part of any colposcopy um, service in the UK. The reason for that is is the MDT brings together all aspects of the colposcopy service. It brings together the screening aspects, the cytology, HPV, colposcopy, histology, and brings everything together. So with my Public Health England hat on, that's actually the single biggest benchmark parameter we look at is how well an MDT runs. And what, what DICES allows you to do in that MDT is actually, as I, as I said through the presentation, is critically look at the colposcopy. You can actually look at the colposcopic opinion that was given because often, with, especially with conservative management, low-grade disease, you're not biopsying these patients. So you don't always have histology to look at that you can now categorically look um, at the colposcopy. So it really depends on what your MDT referral criteria are, but your MDT becomes a much more robust process by being able to look at all aspects um, of your particular case in, um, in, each, in each lady you've decided to discuss at MDT. Okay, thanks, Julian. Uh, I think we've probably got time for one more one one more last question. I think you may have may have already answered this one, but um, how will DICES help me to manage a type three transformation zone? Um, I, I, again, a type three transformation zone is difficult, especially in ladies who may have had previous treatment or those ladies who are postmenopausal. If the transformation zone has regressed to be invisible because it has gone back up into the canal, DICES just like a traditional colposcope, you know, don't throw mud at DICES because it's not able to see a type 3 transformation zone, neither is a traditional colposcope because the transformation zone has regressed into the canal, okay? So in terms of a type 3 transformation zone, 
it's not necessarily going to give you any advantages over a traditional colposcope, but you do have all of the additional advantages of being able to longitudinally track that patient. You can see if any changes occur um, over time, but it's not magically going to allow you to see six, seven, eight, nine millimetres into the cervical canal. Okay. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, on that note, I think we're coming up to um, the end of our hour. So I would like to thank uh, everybody for attending from uh, all different corners of the world. And I'd like to thank the panel, specifically Julian, um, for an excellent presentation. Um, we will be in touch with uh, all of the um, attendees, um, as I mentioned before, to give you um, a, an overview of all the Q&A. Um, as well as a copy of the presentation and a link to the evidence. Thank you very much indeed for joining. Goodbye. Uh, good morning. Take care, guys. Stay safe. Thank you.